Okay, so I have all of these um, quizzes that have been handed in. So let's go over this um, and see how you did, okay? I know y'all missed this class Monday, didn't you? Didn't you miss it? So you had time to really review these hormones. Let's see how you did. What's a goiter? It's an enlarged thyroid gland. That's what it is. There's two reasons for goiter goiters may occur. So one was hypothyroidism and the other is hyperthyroidism. You could have just put that and gotten it correct. But you could have also been more specific. You could have said Hashimoto's thyroiditis, endemic goiter, meaning you don't have enough iodine in the diet. Or you could have said Graves' disease. Would they all have been fair to know? Okay, stop me if there's a question on here that we didn't cover yet. Where is cortisol produced? Adrenal glands. What's the function of cortisol? Tissue repair. It's a, that's the major function for it. It's tissue repair. Okay. It does other things as well. So it, I'll see what you put. So hopefully you didn't leave blanks. Okay. But that's the thing to think about. Why is cortisol released? That's not on here. But why is cortisol released in times of stress? Because in times of stress, might you have tissue damage? Yeah. So are you going to need tissue repair? So that makes really good sense that in times of stress, the adrenal glands secrete cortisol, right? Okay. Name a hormone from the thyroid gland that lowers blood calcium levels, which you say. Calcitonin. Calcitonin. You spelled it correctly so that phonetically I won't think that you were like somehow between a couple of things that sound alike and you were just hoping for some credit. So hopefully you spell that correctly. Name a hormone that raises blood calcium levels. Calcit uh, calcitriol does from the kidneys, but also par we hadn't gotten to that yet really, but um, parathyroid hormone does. So that was a fair question on here because parathyroid hormone raises blood calcium levels. List two reasons imbalances in blood calcium levels are so dangerous. And yes, calcium gives you strong bones and teeth, but that's not why it's so dangerous when levels get out of homeostasis. Give me one. Tetany. Do you know what that means? Sustained. sustained. If you put tetany, that's good. It's Because I'm going to assume you know it means a sustained muscle contraction in times of hypocalcemia. Nerve, proper uh, nerve communication. So cells that can, can communicate and then proper blood clotting as well, right? Great. Thymocin's target? T lymphocytes. And then if I were to ask you what's the function of, of thymocins, you'd say protection. Because T lymphocytes are a special <laughs> kind of white blood cell that protects. These quizzes that I'm going that I go over, I do this because I think feedback's really important, especially prompt, because I don't want you all to sit there and think, oh, that quiz is over and then start thinking about something else. Keep keep focused, okay? Because all of these reviews should be helping, hopefully. Okay? Ovulation is a function of which hormone? Luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone. Where is luteinizing hormone from? From the pituitary. Right. Any hormone question, anything about any hormone ever. Right? So... That might not have been something we actually mentioned the last lecture, but you should be reviewing all hormones all the time, right? Luteinizing hormone, right. Epinephrine is released from the adrenal glands. Its function is to stimulate the blank nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system. Was this a fair quiz? What exactly is diabetes insipidus? And I said exactly. It means that you've had a decrease or, or, or cessation, just stopping, of making antidiuretic hormone, which means that now you're going to be producing tons of urine, right? Because that's what diabetes really means, just a, a production of a lot of urine. So it has to do with a hyposecretion of antidiuretic hormone. Fair? Okay. So I hope you did okay. If you didn't do okay, it's... It's okay, but obviously, I mean, but, but at this point, you, you better start getting it because let me tell you what I decided to do this morning. Um, I think it's a, it's a good decision and I, 
I think it'll be fair to do this. <laughs> so it actually will be helpful to you guys, I think, because it means you'll have more tests and not fewer. Uh, I'm gonna give you a test on just the endocrine system. It's gonna be a multiple choice test. It will be next week. So uh, be ready for it. it. Depending on if we finish today, I think we will. So be ready for it Monday during what would be, I mean, I don't know. We're not here what Monday, are we? Ha, ha. Someone had to find that out for me the other day. Um, okay, so I forget about holidays. Um, on farms, you don't get holidays. Okay, so, all right. But anyway, it, it, the, the college is closed Monday. So next Wednesday, be ready during the lab time. If you, well, no, I don't want y'all sitting here worrying about it. So we'll do it first thing, and then we'll have lecture afterwards, okay? But we'll get that out of our way. So next Wednesday, we are going to have a multiple choice test on just the endocrine system. It will count as a test. And then that means I'll break up that cardio. It, I usually give a test, a multiple choice test on endocrine and cardiovascular, which is three chapters. But now I'll break that up for you guys, okay? So only chapter 17 deeper insights? Uh, chapter 17, everything in chapter 17, deeper insights, disorders, anything I've talked about, anything I've talked about, right? Of course, you would not have a question that was like minutia right within that chapter it would have to have been something i talked about or that you find in the deeper insights or the disorders tables table table fair that will be a week from today I forgot about monday being off really okay all right is it hot in here all right so let me let me tell you all something else i'm getting some questions about the labs the lab next wednesday you will also use that endocrine, that little endocrine thing on visible bodies, visible bodies. You'll use that, plus you'll use your textbook, plus you'll just Google whatever you wanna see. Those 10 major endocrine glands, you will have a lab quiz too. That should take you about 60 seconds. And no, you won't have a word bank. And yes, spelling will count. Fair, is that fair? So next Wednesday, you'll have a multiple choice test on the endocrine system that will count as a test, not a quiz. And you will have a lab on just those 10 organs, right? And I'll show you the organs again in case somebody is not clear which organs, all right? Use the visible body to help you see some of them um, because you don't know whether I will be giving you pictures that, you've, that are from your book. Would it be okay if I didn't? Sure it would, because you know where those organs are, and you know what they look like, even if they were on tables individually. They won't be, but I'm just saying, right? All right, so also in the visible body lab, the first, the, the first thing that you have says um, something, it's anatomical terminology, but then also directional terms. Then there's something in there that is a scavenger hunt packet thing that is not for me that is for you have fun with it i don't want it and i don't care about that i just put it on there for you you know so you can look at it but i don't want it i want you to know that your your next lab and i was going to do these the same day but i think since next wednesday it's going to be kind of busy the second lab quiz in this class will be on those those uh, medical terminology that little link that shows medical terminology but then also directional terms. And then in your textbook, if you look in your textbook, um, if you look in your textbook, you will see, and this is what you all studied in AMP1, but some of you didn't have me for AMP1, um, but that's fine. Even those of you who had me for AMP1, this was the lowest lab quiz average, even compared to, even compared to um, muscles. It, to me, it's just amazing that that could happen, but it was. So, do you remember this page? I'm going to do it from this page. I have given you all some other things in AMP1, but I'll promise you that anything I ask you on the Lab 2 quiz would either come from the invisible body, the terminology, the directional terms, or this page. Nothing else. Not, not, not that scavenger hunt packet. Just this. Do I have any questions about this now? Because 
I end up getting like email questions, which is fun, but you know, it's just the same questions. So do you have any questions about it? You know what's gonna be on lab two? This lab two won't be next Wednesday, will it? It would be the week after. But you should be looking at it now. Yes, Blair. Uh, Blair, this is in this edition, this is page um, 30. And it's it's just it's a picture uh, of anterior posterior aspects of a male and a female. And for those of you who are new to me, because I have a few of you, let me tell you how that second lab quiz will be. I will, there will be fill in the blank. So like from this picture, and also medical terminology, it'll be all fill in the blank. So from this picture, I would say something like, the armpit, and you would see armpit on here, is more accurately referred to as the blank region, and you'd put axillary, right? Or I might put um, the carpal region is more commonly referred to as the blank, and you would put wrist. So if you know these sort of backwards and forwards, the common names and the real, you know, the, the medical terms for these regions, you'll be fine because I'll be asking you one or the other. Filling in the blank. Same thing with definitions for the medical terminology, which is on that visible body link, and then also directional terms. And, and it would have to have been in that visible body. But if it's in that visible, those two visible body links, would it be fair to be on the second lab quiz? Will it be? Yes. Uh, yes, Rebecca. No, just those things I just said. What, what, well, I haven't really looked at that visible body, the second link, the directional terms doesn't have cavities on it. It doesn't have cavities, and neither does that <laughs> medical terminology thing. It doesn't. Anything on those though, I'm gonna, I'm gonna open, let me tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna open that page up, I'm gonna open those up, and I'm gonna write some questions that are filling the blank. That's what I'm gonna do, and I'm not gonna use anything else. Yes, Sarah. I don't have to Pardon? I don't have to So you've got the code, and you put the code I've in. Downloaded. You've downloaded it, and you can't see it. So well. The only thing that's on there is where I can just click on the parts and just oh okay no then what you have to be is in my course so if you enter it through through canvas under my link it should be entering you into my course so it sounds like you're not in my course yet we can don't leave for today until we figure it out certainly don't leave here by next wednesday until you figure it out because it will be the next week yes i just said it won't be next wednesday but you would be ready for it the next time we come right all right, so everybody's good, right? Everybody good. All right, everybody knows what's coming up. Hey, by the way, the 10 major organs of the endocrine system, they're on here. So don't just look at this picture because this will not be the picture you're seeing or the pictures of the organs you're seeing. But do look at the, just so you know which 10 they are, look at this. This is provided for you on the PowerPoint. This is from your textbook, isn't it? Um, we stopped, I think, I don't even know, with the adrenal glands, did we not? Did we? Uh, would anybody happen to know what slide that was? 60? Did somebody say 60? Oh, oh, AGS? Um, I really just don't like these pictures. I really don't, but you know, nobody asked me, do they? Um, really? All right, so um, to the adrenal glands, and what I had wanted you all to know from the adrenal glands, I didn't care about the histology, but I needed you to know the hormones. So we know epi, ep epinephrine and norepinephrine come from the center, but anyway, I didn't care about that. But then also we said aldosterone. And you all would have been ready for questions about aldosterone today. You would have known exactly where it targeted, what it does when it gets there, and what effect that would have. So, right? You would have known that about aldosterone. Also, cortisol, which you got an opportunity to tell me how much you knew about that. And then, also, we know that there's sex hormones that are also released from the adrenal glands. And when we say this, we can, we can kind of think about these as uh, another way that, that 
men can get testosterone, but they also get estrogen, a form of estrogen, and women get these hormones from there as well. Uh, we know testosterone is the hormone that causes libido, which is sex drive. So, uh, you know, that's important for everybody. Now, what can happen is this. What can happen is this, is that there can be a hyper secretion of this at in a fetus. So when that happens, that can lead to something called AGS, androgenital syndrome. And I, I think there's a picture in your book, but I don't have it in my PowerPoints. I, I had it in one of my slides, but y'all could look in the in a picture in the book. And what you'd see is the genitalia of a little female where the labias look fused. They are fused. The labia. The li labia, mean, labia means lips, right? Labia and then lips and the genital region. They're fused. And the clitoris is large for a clitoris. So the clitoris in a female is the analogous structure to a penis in a female. So now you've got this little neonate that's just born and the labia are fused and the clitoris looks like a penis and it really does look like a penis. So this genitalia is sometimes referred to as ambiguous genitalia, meaning that you look at this infant and you think, huh, doesn't quite look like a boy, but certainly doesn't look like a girl, right? So this, this is what happens when there's an over secretion of testosterone in the fetus as the fetus is developing. Little girls can be born with masculinized genitalia. How you would notice if you were really paying attention though, and you really don't have to pay that much attention. Y'all know that little boys, scrotal sacs, baby boys are huge, aren't they? The scrotum of a little baby boy, though, are the same tissues that become the labial folds on a female. So if those folds have fused, it looks like a flattened scrotum is what it really looks like. But of course, on baby boys, can you palpate the scrotal sac and feel the testes? Well, certainly you wouldn't be able to do that on these little girls. So you know right away, it might look like a little boy at first glance, but then you'd realize, no, wait a minute, these are labia that have just fused. And this is not a penis, this is a clitoris, right? So, um, a problem. And that's because of the over secretion, hyper secretion of testosterone in utero. Now, this hyper secretion uh, from the adrenal glands of these sex hormones can also start in women after they've, you know, they've had regular development, now they're fully developed women, and all of a sudden there's this hyper secretion of testosterone. What, would you, what are some of the signs you think you might see in women who have a ton of testosterone over chronic periods of time? It can affect the, it can cause the creation actually even of the larynx building up like an Adam's apple. The voice can deepen. Women can end up getting hair on their chest and, and, um, and face where you don't usually expect that in women. Um, the good side effects is maybe their libido goes up, but no, no, I'm not trying to joke. That's, that, I can't joke. I should not joke. About this. That, so that would be a problem in women, wouldn't it? So the hypersecretion can happen. No, it can also happen in males, but are male, do males have testosterone anyway? And so this is another reason that they um, might have too much testosterone, which can happen. Okay. But all right, so we're good with that. Now, um, are we good with that? Okay. What if I tell you the side effect of cortisol and being under stress and being under stress for chronically long periods of time? Suppresses your it suppresses the immune system. And what did I tell you is a synthetic version of cortisol? Prednisone. Prednisone. Prednisone's a wonderful <coughs> drug, isn't it, to treat with. It can help people that have uh, chronic lung disease, help their tissues repair, people who've had severe as asthma and or um, like I said, other respiratory illnesses that can help people who've had systemic types of skin disorders. It can help the tissues repair. So it's a really good thing, but for short periods of time, because you know you're, you're suppressing that person's immune system. It's also going to be throwing off their electrolyte balance. This is why people who get put on prednisone for uh, long periods of time have what is called, I did not coin this phrase, it is called a moon face, a moon face where they get this kind of appearance of a uh, very, you know, it's because of fluids building up in these fatty tissue areas. And it's a very distinctive look. How many of you have seen people that you would recognize they're on prednisone?
rut. It's, it's just very easy to see when somebody's been on that for too long. All right, so now I want to talk about the pancreas. And when we're looking at this pancreas, we know that the pancreas, um, where it is, it's just slightly inferior and slightly dorsal to the stomach. So right here, the stomach, which is a J-shaped muscular churn, has been removed. Okay, so the stomach has been removed for you. The stomach empties its contents into the first part of the small intestines called the duodenum or the duodenal region. So this is the first part of the small intestines. The stomach has been taken all out so you can see the pancreas here. And you immediately notice that there's ducts running through this pancreas that empty into the small intestines. Don't you see that? You see that, right? So the pancreas is actually obviously going to be secreting something into those ducts. And what those, that something is are exocrine, exocrine, um, you can call them hormones if you want to, but exocrine hormones that are going to help with digestion. So we'll talk about those when we get to the digestive system, okay? And we'll add to our list. But for right now, I want you to think about the pancreas as being either exocrine or endocrine in its function. And we're going to think about the endocrine functions. What's, what hormones are going to be produced and sent into the bloodstream. So insulin and glucagon. And what does insulin do? It lowers blood glucose levels. How? Two reasons, two ways it does it. How does it do it? Two ways. How does insulin lower blood glucose levels? But you've just eaten a, a meal with carbs and most meals have even some carbs, and so carbohydrates are going up in your bloodstream. <laughs> well, essentially, so it, it's going to escort glucose molecules into your cells. So cells need glucose for ATP production, don't they? And the way they get glucose is because insulin escorted them into the cell. So that's a way, right, so that's, the way, that's one way it's lowering blood glucose levels. Another way that it's lowering them is by causing glucose molecules in the bloodstream to actually form molecules of glycogen. And you all should know that glycogen is a storage form of glucose that will end up going to muscles and livers, the liver, to be stored between meals. So insulin is escorting glucose into cells and insulin is causing the production of glycogen. Are we good? And both of those things are doing what to blood glucose levels? And why don't we want blood glucose levels staying too high for too long? Neurotoxic. So when it starts to get low, that's okay too, because what can happen? What's, gonna, what's the pancreas gonna get a signal to produce? Glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone from the pancreas. What's it going to target? Glucagon. Glycogen from the liver and the muscles. And that glycogen is going to be broken down. And when it's broken down, you told me it's made of what? Glucose. glucose. So now blood glucose levels are coming back up. Is that right? Okay, so you do that until you run out of stores of glycogen. And then do you drop down dead? <laughs> but do you? No, because can you burn other things for energy? Yes. What, you can, you'll start to burn some fats for energy, won't you? You will. As soon as your glycogen reserves are gone, you'll start burning fats. No big deal. You'll start burning them. But are fats as clean or as quick a source of fuel as, as carbs? No, because when you burn fats, what do you make? Ketone bodies, which puts you in a acidosis state. And if your pH is changing, is that putting stress on the system? Because your system's going to have to buffer it back up, isn't it? Right. So we said it's a good, that's a great sources of, of energy if you've run out of carbs. But carbs are your cleanest, quickest source of fuel. And what did we say? What two types of cells must rely on carbs for energy? Must have carbs for energy. There's two types of cells in your body that must have carbs for energy. And so doing a no-carb or too low-carb diet, it doesn't even make any sense. It makes a good sense about why you get rapid results because you're going to start burning fats quickly as soon as glycogen reserves are gone. But it makes no sense physiologically because your nervous system cells 
and your red blood cells can only use carbs for energy. The rest of your 198 plus cells, they can use fats, but those two have to have carbs. This is why you start feeling so freaking weak when really there are no carbs and you have to be careful about those really low carb diets. Um, I didn't even understand that. But anyway, uh, but you would have to be really careful about that because those two types of cells that, that use it. All right, so you all see tons of pictures. You have these available. It's, it's up to you to make sure you'd recognize a pancreas if you saw it, okay? Now, there's also another hormone from the pancreas, and I don't think you'll ever hear about it, so, I, so I'm not. It, okay, so, so they're called somatostatins, but I don't really care. It, I, they, it plays a role, though, just FYI. This hormone plays a role in mediating somatomedins that are from the liver that's mediating growth hormone. We have so, and with this really, I don't want you to even, you know, I just want you to be impressed how many checks and balances your system has. It has so many checks and balances of your, your cells and your tissues interacting with each other, you know, you, that you, you can stay in homeostasis usually even if something almost shuts down because there are other checks and balances in that system, right? Okay, all right. Okie dokie then, I'm moving on. Um, I want to talk about disorders of this. And this, chap this chapter makes me crazy. I mean, these, these um, and I know I'm the one who put it up there, but okay, forgive me. I wanna talk though about, and I know it's at the bottom, but they're in there somewhere. I wanna talk about problems with the pancreas. And I don't even care to get to the notes, but I'm not making any of it up. So we said diabetes simply means, that word simply means you're, you're making a lot of urine, right? And y'all know what urine is. Urine is actually filtered blood plasma, so that's affecting your blood volume, isn't it? If you're making a ton of urine, isn't it? Wouldn't it be? Sure, it would. So that's what diabetes means. And we said um, there's diabetes insipidus, that's because of anti diuretic hormone. But then most of the time, when people are talking about diabetes, it's assumed that they're talking about diabetes mellitus. Now, I do want you to know that um, I actually wish these two. Um, well, there's more than this, but we'll add to them as we go along. These two major types of diabetes mellitus, I wish they were called completely different things, not just type 1 and type 2, or not just insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, IDDM, or N, non, N-I-D-D-M, non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, which is type 2. I wish they weren't called kind of the same thing because they're completely different beasts. Are you ready to hear about them? Type one, which is often referred to as insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, IDDM, type one, used to be called juvenile diabetes. Why do you think? Because the onset was when you were a juvenile, actually all the way up to mid 20s. But most people who had, uh, and most people today who have IDDM type one will be diagnosed before their mid twenties. And most of them are actually gonna be even much younger, even pre-puberty. Let me tell you what this disease is. This is an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune, what does that mean? The immune system cells attacking cells. That means your immune system is attacking the cells that produce insulin. And let me tell you about these pancreatic cells. Oh, I'm not gonna put that, I'm not gonna talk about that till that one, until, um, let me talk about these cells. These are called the beta islet cells of the pancreas. And they all need to know that. So these specialized cells in the pancreas called beta islet cells produce insulin. And if your immune system decides one day to make antibodies that destroy them, are you eventually gonna not be able to make insulin? Right, and that's what type one insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus is all about. And typically the onset is young. It's an autoimmune disease. Now, let me tell you about the other, and then I'm gonna tell you about some things that go along with these diseases. So, 
The other one, type 2 or non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, this is typically going to be behavioral. And y'all can do the research on this and, and whatever, but you'll hear that this is kind of a behavioral thing. And what you'll see as far as factors go for developing this are going to be um, obesity, age, which you can't, you can't you know, there's the alternative to, to not aging is not a good one either. So anyway, but aging, and there is a genetic component. So genetics, aging, obesity, and inactivity. So these are behavioral things that can lead to this other type of diabetes. And the type 1, it's about 10% of diabetics have type 1. And 90 plus percent have this other. Now, of the 90 plus percent that has type 2, they can progress to a point that they become insulin dependent. But that doesn't mean that they now have type, you know what I'm saying? They can progress to that point because they become so brittle. How many of you know people with diabetes mellitus? Raise your hands if you do. How many of you know people, do y'all know, that are on insulin? Raising your hands. How many people do you know that are on insulin that really have the type 2, but they're on insulin because they're brittle, diabetics, and they're not controlled? Exactly. Of those people who raised your hands, how many of you know uh, those people will give themselves shots of insulin so they can eat that cake? Exactly. Look at the hands. Because you've seen it. You know it, right? All right, so what's the big deal? You can give insulin, right? You can give insulin. What's the big deal about this? Well, it's a huge deal. People who are in that 10% that have the autoimmune disease, they're so brittle because they produce no insulin. They've got to have glucose blood monitoring checks dozens of times a day. They're going to have to get insulin that can right now, hopefully soon this will change, but right now can only be given through injections. The insulin, the way it acts on them can be fine for a period of time and all of a sudden go south. And when you give insulin, what's going to happen to your blood glucose levels? They're going to drop. And you told me that, or maybe you didn't tell me this, but I'm telling you, when most diabetics that die from the actual insulin, you know, how glucose, blood glucose is, die because of low blood glucose. Because they were given what? Insulin. Sometimes it's not even too much. It's what they had been giving themselves. But all of a sudden, it's now taking them low. And they're so low now that they're, what, ce what cells did I tell you have to have carbs? What did I just tell you? Have to have carbs. Nervous system cells and blood cells. And what did I tell you? The nervous system controls all of them. All homeostasis. So these people are going to go into a deep sleep. Actually, it's called a coma. It's called insulin shock. And so what happens with them is that if that is not caught, and they're asleep, but if that is not caught, then they can actually go, it can be irreversible and they can die from that. So insulin is a serious medication. It should never be given unless you are doing routine. Glucose. And those type 1 diabetics, they have to do that. They have to be so conscious of that. It is a lifestyle change. So is type 2 diabetes. It is a, a significant lifestyle change, but it is not the same thing as type 1. It isn't. It is not nearly uh, as precarious, if you will, as the type 1. Now, what are some of the, um, the consequences? The consequences of going too low, I just told you, is the nervous system is affected, which can take you into shock, coma, and death. Going too high for long periods of time, though staying too high is going to cause neuropathies because it's neurotoxic. Glucose is neurotoxic. So uh, this is absolutely going to end up causing nerve damage that is progressive. It is going to end up causing vascular, the, the blood vessels are not going to be as flexible flexible so it causes cardiovascular disease it puts a strain on that and it can actually destroy the kidneys how many of you know anybody who's on dialysis which means that their kidneys aren't filtering so now they have to have their blood removed from this called hemodialysis 
but removed from their body, filtered out externally, and then put back in. How many of you know people? I would bet, and I and you could go see how close I am to being right. Raise your hands again. I would bet those people's kidneys failed about 80% of those that had, because of their diabetes complications. Blair said, yeah, hers was. Do the rest of y'all know? For sure. Okay, so diabetes, it doesn't just affect your glucose and, and maybe cause your feet to hurt or your uh, blood vessels to start collapsing. It shuts your kidneys down. It can cause such poor circulation that your tissues start to die, which is called necrosis, and it sets you up for gas gangrene. How many of you have seen gas gangrene? Gas gangrene, guess what the treatment is? Amputation. So these, these are serious disease, these, these are serious consequences, serious diseases. Nervous system, another serious consequence is sight. So people can lose their sight. Retinopathies, these are called. So people can actually start to lose their sight. They can, their kidneys are affected, they whatever. Now look, people with these diabetes mellitus type one and type two, they're not able to use glucose the way they're supposed to. In type one, it's because they don't have insulin to escort it into the cells. In type two, it's because the cells have gotten so sick of insulin, they have changed the receptors and pulled them off the cell membranes. They become insensitive to insulin. Most type two diabetics, even the ones that are on insulin, they're still making insulin. They make insulin but all of their cells have slammed the door shut and said, stop, <laughs> you know, because they, they're not using glucose. So if they're not using glucose, then they're having to use fats for energy. Did y'all say that's a clean, quick source of fuel? You said that's not, that's okay to do in, in, in short term, but if you're doing it long term, you're going to have a problem with your pH. And that problem with your pH is going to lead to other Domino effect problems. Is that right? Do you have a question, Casey? Yeah, why do diabetics get intoxicated so easily? Like, don't they get intoxicated quicker than the other person? Um, I, I think they, I think intoxication has all everything to do with like alcohol intake. But I, you know, um, so alcohol is processed through the liver. I, I'm not trying to, but I get. But anyway, um, so alcohol, if you think about it, alcohol is just a sugar, isn't it? Isn't it just a sugar? And alcohol gets processed through the liver, and you have to have certain enzymes in the liver, and that's a hereditary thing, like you have these enzymes that can help to break down alcohol. So some people, it might not have anything to do, it might not, a little, it's going to have a little to do with it but it might not have everything to do with it. Some people don't have a lot of that enzyme. So like Native American Indians, Irish, there, there's some hereditary reasons why some people get, um, can't process alcohol as quickly as other people can. Uh, but it is a sugar and it is an empty calorie sugar and it does have to get broken down. And so it, you know, it probably all plays more, but I can't give you the chemistry. Does anybody else know that in here? Well, as, um, Okay. So that's all I think of that because there's this girl that we drink constantly and pass out and you don't know if it's she's passing out drunk or her insulin is screwed up. Which is just unfair. If people have a condition, they shouldn't cause confusion by adding things like alcohol to it. You know, I've always said that. But but you know, we're people, so we do it. We have our things with there. Some people drink. Um, all right, so um, back I think all right look so so let me let me say this so if they're not if people aren't using the glucose it's out in the blood it's out in the blood plasma and what did y'all say filtering blood plasma the kidneys are filtering blood plasma but now you have this big old molecule these molecules of glucose that are staying in the filtrate and guess what it's doing to the filtrate os the osmolarity of the filtrate in the kidneys y'all know what I'm talking about when I say that so the kidneys filter blood plasma, and then you're gonna to have to pull things back from that. And y'all said water moves how? Between two compartments, how does water move? Yeah. Down its gradient. So from high concentrations of water to low concentrations of water, how water's gonna move, you can't even change that. 
You can, in your cells, change how solids move but with pumps. But you can't change how water is going to move. It's going to move between high concentrated areas to low. So now, all of a sudden, the filtrate has all this, these solutes, glucose. And now the osmolarity is so high, water's being pulled from your blood. And as water's being pulled from your blood plasma, you're doing a lot of what? Peeing, aren't you? You're doing a lot of peeing. And so it is, do you get what I'm saying? Because glucose is staying in the urine. Should glucose ever be a normal finding in your urine? No, it is not a normal finding in urine. If you've got glucose in your urine, it means that you are probably siphoning off water with it, which is now going to be putting a burden on the system for dehydration, chronic dehydration of the cells. Do you see that? Can you see that? So anyway, it's just, it's a, um, lots of pee. This is called polyuria. Y'all would not want to know what polyuria is. And if you're peeing a lot, you're dehydrated, you're probably thirsty. Does anybody know what that word is? For thirsty, the medical term, polydipsia. Then do you know what, if you're thirsty and you're thirsty and you are uh, peeing a lot and you're not able to use glucose and your cells are thinking, we're struggling here. So you're feeling like you're hungry. So guess what you're going to usually be doing? Eating. Does anybody know what that overeating, really? A lot of eating. So that's polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria. These are all signs of that. Then here's another word for you. Do those words make sense to you? You're going to know those? Because poly means what? A lot. So yeah, a lot. Uh, here's another one for you. Hyperglycemia. What does that mean? Too much sugar, glyce, in the bloodstream, emia, hyperglycemia. Here you go, here's another one. Glycosuria, one word, glycosuria. These are all symptoms of diabetes mellitus. Sugar in the pee, that's urine. exactly right. Sugar in the urine, glycosuria. So what words do you have down as symptoms, signs and symptoms of diabetes mellitus? One and two, what are they? Polyuria, mean you're making a lot of urine. Polydipsia means you're what? Thirsty. Y'all know, y'all have all heard your whole life, if somebody's really excessively thirsty, what should you check? Their sugar levels, their glucose levels. So you've heard that, haven't you? So poly, uh, this, yeah, polyphagia, uh, hyperglycemia, glycosuria, these are all signs and symptoms of diabetes mellitus, one and two. That whole thing, being a slightly dehydrated, osmolarity being off, what's it putting pressure on? The heart. The heart. It is. The kidneys are filtering at rates they were never really designed to do. Pressure on those kidneys, the hypertension that can go along with some of this is going to end up doing a number on the kidneys. Tissue damage to death, to necrosis, is, could lead to gas gangrene, which means that amputation is the next thing on that. Neuropathies, where people have continued painful nerves, like their feet ache. And, it, you know, the descriptions of that are, are just whatever, you know, bad, right? So people are in a lot of pain a lot of times. All right. So 90% um, being because of those reasons we just talked about. Why can't we call type 1 juvenile anymore? Because type 2 is being diagnosed in our children now in um, – industrialized countries and even in developing countries we're seeing it even in developing countries where children are being diagnosed with the type 2 and again what we say causes that genetics. it's not genetics I mean genetics is one little component but what is it it's behavioral issues now you will read and I want you all to do your own research you will read that um, I think you'll see this. You can you can let us know if you don't see this. Most of the scientific community, medical community, agrees that this is behavioral. 
and this can be changed. So, but is it easy to change behavior? Is it? No, it's, it's tough and it's hard, isn't it? It's really, really hard to do that. Um, but anyway, also just to give you something to think about in our country, it's something like, I want to say almost 90% of our healthcare costs are coming from two diseases. Do you know what they are? Diabetes mellitus type two, type two, because that's 90% of our diabetics are type two. The burden they're putting on the system, the whole system, and who's got to pay for that is coming from them and also uh, smokers. And both of those things are what? Behavioral. So you have to think to yourself, wow, well, there's hope for a better tomorrow, right? And it's all through education, right? But the hope for the better tomorrow is that with education, people can know that and understand that and um, maybe change some of that. But again, that's probably the hardest thing to change, is behavioral. Okay, so, um, all right. The gonads. So we know the gonads are, we know the gonads are going to be our ovaries and, our, and the testes. Is that right? So the ovaries and the testes. And y'all can see all kinds of pictures here for ovaries and testes. And um, make sure you know where they are, uh, where these gonads are. And what I'm going to want you to know if I can actually, uh, okay, so let's start with ovaries if we will. Okay. I hate these notes. All right. I know, I know, and I like those better. Okay, so anyway, let's start with ovaries. So I'm telling you what you need to know, right? So in the ovaries, what will happen at puberty is that the pituitary gland is going to release two gonadotropins, FSH and LH. Do you remember? Let's just think about women right now, or, or females. So at puberty, FSH from the pituitary gland and LH from the pituitary gland target the ovaries in a female. Fair enough? Are we good with that? Is that fair enough? Are you kidding me? Okay, all right, so that's fine. This is good. All right, so here's an ovary. Here's a picture of an ovary. All right, so let's just, we can just kind of go on this one picture. In an ovary, and this is very different, the ovaries compared to the testes. In ovaries, little, little female neonates are born with all of the little tiny primordial eggs they'll ever have. So in a female, those primordial, they're not mature, but those primordial eggs are already present. They're there. They're just dormant. They're lying silently until at puberty, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone from the pituitary, targets one of the ovaries, either the right one or the left one, and it targets one of the follicles, just one. And this is a progression of follicles here. I hate this picture, but okay. So it targets like one follicle so that the one egg inside is under, going to undergo meiosis, which is a very special kind of cell division that's going to help to mature that egg. Are we good with that? So follicle-stimulating hormone will target one follicle a month, and that follicle-stimulating hormone will cause the maturation of that egg, the beginning process of the maturation of that egg inside that follicle. About mid-cycle, luteinizing hormone will cause the follicle to rupture, will cause the follicle to ru this fo it's showing you different follicles, but anyway, it will cause the, the follicle that has the egg to rupture. And when that, that luteinizing hormone causes that follicle to rupture, what gets released? The egg. The egg. Once an egg is released, it has just a few hours to be fertilized. If it doesn't get fertilized with the sperm in those few hours, the egg involutes, gets reabsorbed, dies, but gets reabsorbed. And the cycle is, is going to finish out. And then the next month, another follicle will be targeted. Are you with me? All right. Now, what I want you to know about this, and again, these follicles that you're seeing. If a follicle ruptures and the egg is released and the egg gets fertilized and the egg moves, takes about six days to move through the fallopian tube to the uterus to implant, 
if implantation happens, the uterus will send a signal back that the, follow that the follicle is going to become what's called the corpus luteum. The follicle becomes the corpus luteum. And what I want you to know is that these follicles that become the corpus luteum, these end up producing estrogen, progesterone. Have y'all heard of those things? Mm -hmm. And they produce those, what we consider to be female sex hormones, female sex hormones that are going to be necessary. They're necessary for female secondary sexual characteristics. They're also necessary from this corpus luteum to sustain the pregnancy in the first trimester. How many of you have ever heard that someone has had several miscarriages usually in that first 12 weeks. Have you heard that before? It's actually thought that more than half of all first pregnancies or, or pregnancies get lost in that first 12 weeks. And it's just a natural kind of thing. But if somebody is continuing to do that, do we know where usually the problem is and what's not secreting what it needs to? It's the what? It's the corpus luteum. It's not secreting enough progesterone and estrogen at high enough levels to sustain the pregnancy until the placenta can take over. The first 12 weeks, it's got to be relying on these. And so if that can be figured out, some women can have help with that, you know, and that can help them to get through that first 12 week days. Um, but usually, you know, whatever. So are we good? You have any questions? Yes. Estrogen and progesterone. And I'll tell you this, now listen to this and, and hold on to that just a second. If you get pregnant, if, if it's six days you after ovulation, you get, you're pregnant, you have implantation in the uterus, that signal gets sent back and this corpus luteum is gonna, it's not gonna involute, it's gonna stay around for that, and it's gonna stay around and pumping out high levels of estrogen and progesterone. And when I say high, I, I want you to know that if they actually do get significantly high, we're going to see that, that estrogen can get 30 times the normal rate during a pregnancy. But they just get high enough that, let me tell you what else is going to be released. It's called inhibin. Inhibin is a hormone that is going to suppress FSH. Inhibit from the ovaries suppresses <laughs> FSH. What did y'all say FSH does? It targets a follicle for the maturation of eggs, right? FSH targets, okay, but now inhibit is, is suppressing it. Let me ask you something. If you've got this corpus luteum, if you've got these, this corpus luteum that is pumping out estrogen and progesterone at pretty high levels and inhibit, do you need another egg next month? You're already pregnant. Do you need another egg next month being produced? You do not. So they suppress FSH so that you won't be, get another egg produced the next month. Have there been rare occurrences where someone had multiple fetuses, twins if you will, certainly not identical, of different gestational ages? Yes, and this is when this didn't quite work the way it was supposed to. It didn't suppress the FSH enough. Guys, ladies, and guys, hormone, uh, hormones that are used for uh, birth control, those hormones raise your estrogen and progesterone levels just enough that your body thinks it's pregnant. So because your body thinks it's pregnant, FSH is being suppressed. Because if you're pregnant, you don't want another gestation going on, right? So that's how those, that's how birth controls, hormonal birth controls, female work, is by, usually it's a combination, you've got a deeper insight later, and whatever, I'm just telling you this now for FYI, but usually they're a combination of low levels of estrogen and progesterone, but high enough levels that you're not getting a follicle targeted by FSH for an egg to be produced. Good? Okay. So, uh, any questions? No, no. no I get fat. What you say? No, I need weight. Um, so, <laughs> so, 
so these, these hormones play a huge role in how water moves throughout the body. And um, they can play a huge role in that and water intake and that kind of thing. And um, so it can play. But, but usually when we think about weight gain, it's not just water and it's also caloric intake, right? Um, so, you know, it, 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 some people are really sensitive to, though, to the fluids that are changing. And some women can get really, um, you know, you hear about bloating and, um, and that kind of thing, right? And every female is different. And how they respond to that. Okay, so um, so that's the ovaries. Now testes, testes, um, testes are going to be, and this is a cadaver, so you're seeing this. Testes are going to be the male gonads, the male gonads, and when you think about testes, these are going to um, the dip, a major difference in females and males is that males at birth do not have any primordial um, sperm. Males are not going to be producing sperm until puberty, and there no, there's no real primordial germ cells that are involved until then. So the reason, one of the reasons I'm letting you know this is that we do understand that females, at when a small female gets exposed to something like chemotherapeutics, that includes even antibiotics, doesn't it? Or any kind of chemicals throughout their from infancy to even through puberty, could it be affecting the primordial eggs? Yes, can be affecting the primordial eggs. Where males, really aren't making those sperm until puberty. So that's a major difference, isn't it? Um, and what happens in males is FSH targets the testes so that sperm get made. Again, a special kind of cell division called meiosis, so sperm get produced. And males are on, where women are typically on an average 28 day cycle, males are on a 24 hour kind of cycle. So they have cycles too. They just come and go so quickly, they don't get labeled the way that women's cycles do, if you will. But absolutely men are on a 24-hour cycle for this, and it's kind of changing throughout. And sperm counts need to remain a certain number for them to be considered fertile, and they have to be making them daily. Okay, so uh, luteinizing hormone, we said, is going to target interstitial cells to produce testosterone. So that testosterone is also going to play hand in hand with the making of sperm. But I really want you to know FSH is for sperm production in men and luteinizing hormone is for testosterone production in men. So just like testosterone at puberty for males causes secondary male sexual characteristics, estrogen and progesterone does that in female, those secondary sexual characteristics. What are some secondary sexual characteristics in males and females? What are some things you think about? Hair. hair so axil facial hair, axillary, pubic hair. These are normal, natural. Uh, those glands, those sweat glands that are going to be produced. So pheromones are being produced and sent off. Are, are, you, are people conscious of pheromones? They're not really conscious of that, but we, our brains are taking those in. This is why women all get on the same, if they're not doing something that's, that's causing a false, um, you know, like cycle using birth control. If women are not using birth control and are working close enough together, we're smelling each other's pheromones and we'll all get on the same periods. Y'all know that, right? Do y'all know that? And it's because we're smelling those pheromones and we're not conscious of it, but we do that because we're animals and we, we live in herds. So we will, how many, have any, has that happened to any of y'all before? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that actually is a very common phenomenon. Men who are enclosed with women uh, and for long enough periods of time, their testosterone levels go up because they really know they need to be ready on that one day of the month that it might be that they can impregnate the entire herd. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. I'm, just, I'm just saying that is a natural, that is a natural thing. And that is understood. It's understood that that has to be like that. So, um, I mean, not that they need to impregnate the whole herd, but just that, it, that that's a natural thing. We are animals. So, um, so LH and FSH, and 
So we think about those things. For women, we think about breast development, uh, fat deposition in areas that we could distinctly think of as female, don't we? Again, axillary pubic hairs, um, hair, the, the whole thing. So we think about these things. And that's, those are signals, so secondary sexual characteristics are signals to the opposite sex that you are reproductively capable. Uh, doesn't mean you might be ready, but you're repro reproductively capable and it's signaling that to the opposite sex. Okay, so um, I do want you to know about a few other hormones and the ones I'm gonna tell you about, I'm going to tell you. You'll see some others, but we'll list those, we'll add those to our list um, later when we get to some of the organ systems, but some of them I want you to know now. So are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. All right, first let me talk about kidneys. Now, now look, have we had 10, have we had 10 major endocrine glands? We have had 10, haven't we? Do you want me to name them? Let's name them. Hypothalamus, pineal, pituitary, is that right? Y'all know where they are? Thyroid, parathyroid, thymus, pancreas, count for me, um, adrenals, ovaries, and testes. Was that 10? Easy, easy lab, right? Make sure you know what they look like. All right, now these you're not going to have to label. We're going to look at these uh, later and we're going to add to our hormone list later. But there are some I want you to know now for this test next week. We're going to take a break here in a minute, but y'all okay for now? All right. The kidneys. The first thing I do want you to know about the kidneys is that they're essentially two hormones, but this little renin is a protein precursor, if you will, to a hormone. But let, let me talk about these two. Y'all remember calcitriol from where? The bone, study of bones. Do you remember that? And you said that kidneys secrete calcitriol in response from parathyroid hormone targeting the kidneys to release this. And you said that calcitriol is going to travel in the system to the skin. And what are you going to be able to make? Vitamin D, which is then going to help with the absorption of calcium, raising blood calcium levels. So what I want you to know, kidneys secrete calcitriol. Calcitriol raises blood calcium levels, doesn't it? Are we good? Now, I want you to know the second hormone from the kidneys. This is abbreviated EPO. It stands for erythropoietin. Erythropoietin. Erythro as a prefix always means what? Erythema, erythema erythro. What does that mean? It means red. That's what it means. Red, it does. So erythropoietin, this is gonna be the beginning of a, horn, of a cell that is called an erythrocyte. What would an erythrocyte really mean? It means a red cell, a red blood cell. That's exactly right, an erythrocyte. So erythropoietin from the kidney is a hormone that is gonna target bone marrow, bone marrow, where stem cells are found that can become what? Red blood cells. Let me say that again. Erythropoietin from the kidneys target stem cells in bone marrow to become and mature into red blood cells. But now, now y'all just wrote that down and you'll probably memorize it and I'll think, oh my God, they make this so hard for themselves. Listen, what do red blood cells do? They carry oxygen. Where are red blood cells found? Is everybody listening? Where are red blood cells found? And, well, they're found in blood. Red blood cells are, make up the most of the cellular component of blood. Is that right? That's why blood looks what? Red. Okay, look, guys. And you told me that red blood cells are carrying oxygen. Is that what you said? And you said that red blood cells are found in blood. But what organs are filtering blood? Kidneys. So what a perfect site to monitor blood oxygen levels. The kidneys are monitoring blood oxygen levels. And if blood oxygen levels start to drop, that's okay, because what will the kidneys do? Release erythropoietin, 
And what will happen to your red blood cell count? It will go up. And what will happen to your oxygen levels? And that's a perfect classic negative feedback. Are you with me? So what are perfect organs to measure oxygen levels? If you start to get hypoxic or hypoxemia, you are going, your kidneys are going to notice it. Your kidneys are going to secrete erythropoietin. Your red blood cell count's going to go up. And your blood oxygen levels are going to go up. Beautiful, right? Does anybody know, and you want to write this down, does anybody know what a low red blood cell count is called? It is not a diagnosis, because there are a lot of things that can cause this. But do you know what it's called when someone has a low red blood cell count? Anemia. It's called anemia. Write anemia down. That is a low red blood cell count. Fair enough? With anemia, that means your tissues might not be getting enough blood. That means widespread tissue struggling might be, right? We'll talk more about anemia. Does it make sense to you that one of the first signs of kidney failure might not have anything to do with urine output? It might mean that you're, if you, the first sign, actually, every, I would dare say you could go back to everybody who's ever been in kidney failure and go back to their labs and guess what you would have seen way before the actual kidney failure happened? Anemia. Because the kidneys were not producing what? What you say? Okay, there are a lot of reasons for anemia. Iron deficiency, your diet's not what it needs to be with folic acid, B12. There's a ton of reasons for anemia. There's dozens of reasons for anemia. It doesn't mean you're in kidney failure. Okay, but I'm just saying, <laughs> could that be a sign of kidney failure? It could be, but it's, that's not you. Okay. All right, so, um, and guys, renin, I don't care that you have that even on your notes right now. I, I really don't. But it's a protein that's going to end up acting on uh, something else from the liver. And he go, I want you to know the liver ends up producing, with renin and with this, ends up producing something that's called angiotensin. And here's what I really want that should be highlighted is angiotensin. And I want you to know that angiotensin is a hormone that needs products from the kidneys, the liver, and the lungs. And the lungs, by the way, to get to angiotensin. And angiotensin is the body's most powerful vasoconstrictor. That's what angiotensin does. So saying where it's from, you could say it takes the functioning kidneys, the functioning liver, and functioning lungs to get to angiotensin. And when you get to angiotensin and you're making that, it is going to constrict your blood vessels. When blood vessels get constricted, vasoconstriction, that's why I just said it's the most powerful vasoconstrictor known in the body. So when those vessels constrict, what's happened to your blood pressure? The vessels constrict, the volume didn't change, so it goes up. So you guys told me it made perfect sense to you. I know you're feeling overwhelmed, you need a break. But I, you guys told me it made perfect sense to you that one of the first ways to treat high blood pressure, hypertension, is to give a diuretic. Because you said if you give a diuretic, you're decreasing blood volume, which should be helping with blood pressure going down, right? That makes sense to everybody? But another thing, another major quick way is to actually inhibit this um, angiotensin. Angiotensin. If you can inhibit that, that's going to be another way. Because angiotensin raises blood pressure. It raises it. It's a natural blood pressure raise, raiser. Elevator. <laughs> okay. All right. Can we take a quick break and come back? Because I'm losing some of y'all. Go run around the building, okay? It's beautiful outside. All right, look, so guys, let, let me go back and, um, and let's do this. Inhibin in the testes, so in the testes, inhibin is also going to suppress FSH. So this keeps men's, um, can, we talk, can we close that door? Thank you. So this, this, thank you. 
So inhibin in the testes is going to suppress FSH so that, that men's um, sperm levels stay where they need to be. So, you know, sperm can actually, sperm numbers can be too high in men. And some men are infertile because their sperm counts are too high. So that's a problem with inhibin not working because it's supposed to keep it where it needs to be. Remember, we said everything, even good things like sperm, can be too high, right? Too low, too low. It's got to be just right. So, okay, I forgot to tell you that about men. I told you what it did in women. It does the same thing in men. Suppresses FSH, which ends up controlling sperm counts. Okay, so uh, let's go back to this. I wanted you to know that in the kidneys, in, so in the kidneys, we've got erythropoietin and calcitriol being released. In the liver, we said that that's going to contribute to something called angiotensin. But in the liver, I also want you to know about another hormone the liver releases. It's called thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietin. So thrombo. Thrombopoietin is the hormone that's going to initiate stem cells in the bone marrow to become thrombocytes. And does anybody know what a thrombocyte is? <laughs> it's what you all refer to as platelets. Yes, platelets. Does anybody know what the function of platelets are? To clot. Blood body, assist in blood body. So again, the liver secretes thrombopoietin. <clears throat> that thrombopoietin travels to the bone marrow, and the stem cells in the bone marrow will become what? Thrombocytes, which are what we call platelets. So what might be a first sign of liver disease? Thrombocytes not being what? being produced, which means you might start doing what? Bleeding out, not have, having clotting issues. First sign of liver disease is going to be clotting issues. And does that make perfect sense? Mm -hmm. Does it? Okay. Just like a first sign of liver disease is going to be, if somebody's paying attention, it's going to be what? Anemia. Did I say liver again? I meant kidney. Kidney disease might be anemia, which means because kidneys produce what? Erythropoietin, which is going to be the hormone needed for what to be made? Erythrocytes. Are you good? Okay, now I want you to know that the heart, and when the heart produces a hormone called atrial naturetic factor. Oh my God, is this in a note somewhere? Let's see, because I know y'all want me to spell things. I don't know. Just take my word for it. That's what it produces. Okay. Here. Atrial natriuretic factor or peptide. It's, it's sometimes referred to as ANF or ANP. So peptide or factor. Whenever y'all have heard factor or peptide, what do you just know? What molecular class is it? Give us another chance. <laughs> Amino acids hooking together form peptide bonds, and that means that's a, what's that molecule? A protein. It's just proteins, aren't they? So you guys write down A and F or or A and P for now. Atrial natriuretic factor. And what happens with the heart is that this these upper chambers of the heart. I remember the upper chambers of the heart. You've got lower chambers and upper chambers. Atrial natriuretic factor is produced from these atria, and this protein is going to be re, uh, produced in response to high blood pressure. What a perfect thing to be understanding when blood pressure is too high. These, because where is blood coming into the heart? Where does it come into the heart? Where does blood come into the heart? Into the atria, right? Correct. So as blood is coming in, if blood pressure is too high, this A and F or A and P, either one, will be produced, and it will target the kidneys. It will target the kidneys, and it will cause the kidneys to lose sodium. It's going to cause the kidneys to lose sodium in the filtrate. What follows sodium? Water. So what's going to happen to blood pressure? Blood pressure is going to go down. 
Does this sound like targeting the kidneys to affect sodium and doing something to blood pressure sounds a lot like what other hormones? Aldosterone. Does everybody get that that sounds a whole lot like aldosterone, but it's the opposite? It's doing the opposite of aldosterone? Do y'all hear that? It's doing the opposite of it. So where aldosterone is targeting the kidneys to pull sodium in and raise blood pressure, a and F is targeting the kidneys to lose sodium and lose blood volume and lower blood pressure. Are you good with that? Right? Checks and balances. Negative feedback. One thing will do one, will take something one way, but there better be something that's going to help to bring it the next way back down, right? And what a perfect place that the heart is actually doing that. How do y'all feel about these few that we've added? Y'all feel okay about them? I do want to, and there are others, but we're gonna wait till we get to the systems to do these. I do want you to know, I do want you to know that the intestines, the intestines, and really the GI, gastrointestinal tract, those organs, and we have a whole chapter, we deal with these, but these intestines and GI organs produce what are called enteric hormones. And for now, I just want you to know that enteric, enteric hormones are going to deal with what? Digestion. Is that right? So these are going to be hormones. If you've ever wondered why you don't have to think about something after you swallow it until you get the urge to get rid of whatever couldn't be digested 30 feet later, you didn't have to think about it. You didn't even have any control much over it, did you? And those 30 feet, it's because of what hormones? Enteric hormones. Coordinating that system. They play a role in what, how uh, food moves along the system, but also what can be absorbed, broken down and absorbed. So just when you hear that, you'll know that that's what that's referring to. Are you good with that? Now, the chemistry of hormones. We said that some, like our, our sex hormones, are steroidal-based. These are lipid-based. Some are protein-based. I'm not going to ask you all that. I just want you to know. Do you, we have to have the ability in our cells to make hormones. And are we going to need to have lipids in our diets? And are we going to have to have proteins in our diets? And, and really, are, are, we are we, right? And we've got to be able to take in those essential things that we need that we can't make. And that's going to be important. Our cells, I want you all to think about this. Our cells are in a constant state. Even though you have a cell that's mature and is that, you know, whatever, they're constantly replacing receptor proteins on their top surface, which is called apical surface, in response to what they're, what they're seeing out there, in response to what's knocking at the door. So if a hormone is knocking at the door, the cell ends up getting a signal, oh, I, the body's needing this, they end up putting more receptors out and what happens to the response? And that's natural, that goes up. And then the cell's going to have to have this down regulation where it starts pulling them out. And that should stay healthy and normal. Cells changing their plasma membranes, pulling those receptors out, putting them up when they need them in a very coordinated kind of way. Now what happens though, what we said happens in type 2 diabetes, 90% of all diabetes mellitus, is that insulin is out here so much, and this has happened so much, that the cell starts to become resistant and insensitive to insulin. Insulin is still out there, but the cell has gone into essentially a down regulation that it's staying in. So, so medications for type 1 diabetes, medication, uh, type 2 diabetes, type 2, medications do several things. Some of them are influencing the receptors. Some of them are actually causing the, the insulin to stay around longer. And then eventually you might even have to start taking insulin, even though there's insulin there. You're going to have to start taking insulin. Some of them also play a role. Um, I was thinking of another thing. Oh, just the glucose and how the glucose is actually being filtered in the kidneys. 
So some of them are playing a role there. So for type two diabetes, there's a lot of different approaches for therapy, chemotherapy, and different targets based on cellular function, because all disease is at what level? The cellular level, which is really talking about molecular level, isn't it? All disease is at this level. Okay, so, um, so some hormones, when we say synergy, when we say people are work, something works in synergy, it means it works hand in hand. We've had several hormones that raise blood pressure. We've had ADH, aldosterone, and angiotensin, haven't we? They work in synergy, don't they? They're, they're all doing what? Raising blood pressure, aren't they? But then we have some hormones that are going to have antagonistic effects, which is the opposite effect. And the, the example I just gave you was that aldosterone is going to raise blood pressure, but what is ANF going to do? Atrial natriuretic factor atrial natriuretic factor is going to lower it. Now, we said atria means upper chambers of the heart. Natrium is the Latin. Natrium is Latin for what? So in its name, is it telling you what it, where it's from and what it's doing? Pay attention to that. Make sure that you, learn, you, know, you don't make things harder than they need to be for you. Now, let's look at some, uh, some problems when problems come in. So stress. Stress, we know which glands are most affected by stress. The adrenals, you would want to know the adrenal glands are the most affected by stress because what do they need to release? They need to release cortisol, but even before the cortisol, what do they release? They, they, the adrenals release epinephrine and norepinephrine, don't they? In times of stress, that fight or flight response, and then you've got cortisol being released. And this, this stress occurs in three stages. Now, y'all can think of stress as being like a bull is chasing you. You know, you've gone on a hike and all of a sudden a bear is around the corner. Okay, now that's sudden stress, isn't it? But you can think about it sort of like, but actually what we know most happens are not those kind of acute situations. It's other things like relationships and you know finances and, 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 and then also disease, disease in the body, somebody having a chronic disease, a disease like diabetes mellitus, right? So this is the way the body handles this in these stages physiologically. There will be that alarm reaction where the body is sensing that there is this alarm. So Definitely, you're going to, we're going to see what happens there. Then there's going to be that stage of resistance. And hopefully things are going to get corrected here. Because if they do not, the body gets worn out with this. And then you go into what's called the stage of exhaustion. So when you're thinking about diseases like cancer and terminal illnesses, this is what ends up happening. And going to this is going to be a progressive kind of thing that, um, you know, will end up eventually being fatal. So the alarm reaction, see if it doesn't make sense. Aldosterone, angiotensin, it raising those blood pressures so that the heart's getting blood to the tissues that you need so you can fight or you can run. Isn't that right? So the body is doing all of that and the tissues are getting everything they need at kind of an accelerated kind of pace with the understanding that if you're in a fight or flight, you better be getting some cortisol because you might not win or you might not outrun. Isn't that right? So you're going to need some tissue repair, so cortisol. So now you've got these uh, glucose is going to be affected. Glucose homeostasis is going to be affected. Electrolyte balances might be affected. But hopefully you can correct things at this point. And um, during, this, during this time, you can maybe get over it. Now, in the stage of resistance, though, we said it's going to depress the immune system. And you hope you don't stay in this too long because... If you do, you might end up dying of something else that you caught during this time. How many of you have had really stressful times? And, and let's just think of it. It's not too stressful. I don't think nobody. Because we could cry. We think about things we've been through. So we're not going to do that. But we're going to think about like times where, like, let's say exam weeks, right? You're kind of stressed. You're staying up later. You're a little bit worried about GPAs. You can worry because you, you signed up for too many classes. So 26 credits. So anyway, you are, you get a little bit stressed and you get through it, but it's, and you think, oh my God, I can't wait till I get through this because I'm going to go here and I'm going to go there and I'm going to do it. But as soon as you get through it, what happens? Summer flashes. 
<laughs> no, as soon as you get through it, you, you, you have a cold or you're sick or you, you really do get something. And, and you really legitimately get something that you might not have gotten if your immune system had been strong enough. Right? So here's the, here's the moral to that story. Um, manage your stress and try to manage your stress so that you don't get immunocompromised and you don't end up picking up everything in the world. Okay, so here, here now, we're in a stage of exhaustion. So you've probably eliminated your glycogen reserves, you're burning fats for energy, you're now in, um, you're now in uh, hypokalemia, means that potassium levels are off because your pH balances were off. And this, is, this can lead to arrhythmias, it can lead to tissue failure, and it can eventually lead to death. So um, don't stay stressed is the thing, is the whatever. All right, whatever. All right, now I am going to talk about a couple of these, because at this point, I know you might not know them like the back of your hand, but what you would, this is a the deeper insight. Do y'all need to read the deeper insights about anti-inflammatory drugs, steroidal and non-steroidal? Read your deeper insights before that test, because uh, there is one on that, and I do ask you a question. I don't know how to be more fair than that. When you think about disorders, you have to know for every disorder, whether that's a hyposecretion or a hypersecretion. You need to know that because if you don't know that, you wouldn't understand at all why they're being treated the way they are. Okay? So let's just say that right away. Diabetes insipidus uh, causes polyuria. We said that made sense because we understand that it actually conserves water. So if you don't have enough of them, enough of that there, you're going to be making a lot of urine, 10 times the amount of urine you typically do, and it's going to have to be replaced. Endocrine disorders, hypersecretions. I want you to know that a pheochromocytoma, oma at the end of anything means what? Tumor. I don't care if it's at the end of whatever, it's going to mean a tumor. Are all tumors bad? Well, well, okay. Just some of them are more bad than others. I mean, you wouldn't want one, but okay. So an oma means a tumor. Pheochromocytoma, this is a tumor of the adrenal glands where you are pumping out epinephrine and norepinephrine in crazy amounts. What happens to blood pressure and heart rate, contraction strength and rate, and blood pressure because of the vessels and respiratory when you have too much of this? They're all going up. And they're going up really significantly. You can't stay in this for very long or it's a life-threatening event. So when somebody comes in with a pheochromocytoma in your emergency room, what's usually being rolled out first? When they come in, they're sweating, <clears throat> they're panting, they are frantic, their heart rate is like their chest, they're, they're, what's, what's ruled out first? Okay, maybe I didn't give you enough information. What's, what's usually ruled out first, they're going to look like they're on something. So, so they're going to look like they're really on something. So the first, one of the first things that you're going to be doing is ruling out any kind of substance abuse. And once you've ruled that out, you're certainly realizing you got to do something about the heart rate and that blood pressure. That's got to come down. Or they're going to have, you know, a stroke. So typically, once that's ruled out and you've done a scan, you think it's a pheochromocytoma, that this is an emergency surgery. They got to get this thing out. And that can be removed. And so that's a good thing. Right? So that's a good thing, and it should correct it. So this is a tumor that can be removed. A toxic goiter is when you make antibodies that mimic TSH from the pituitary. So now your thyroid thinks it's getting the signal to produce T3 and T4, so it's just doing what it thinks it's supposed to be doing. But is that really TSH out there, or is it your immune system mimicking TSH with antibodies? It's an autoimmune disease that causes a hypersecretion of the thyroid gland. It's called Graves' disease, and it's a toxic goiter, which is not the same as an endemic goiter, which is, what is an endemic goiter? The, an endemic goiter is that you don't have enough iodine in your diet, and you can't make T3 and T4, so your TSH levels are really high. high. What's, what is a, what is Hashimoto's? And y'all need to know that. What is Hashimoto's? They destroy the T3 and T4. It, they destroy those cells in the thyroid that make T3 and T4, so you've got to replace them. It's an autoimmune disease. It's a very common autoimmune disease in women. 
Okay, so here's one of the uh, pituitary disorders. So when we think about when you think about growth hormone and you have a hyper secretion of it, does it make sense to you that if you have it in childhood, everything's going to grow? So you're going to have something like gigantism or giantism. It's referred to as from a hyper secretion. Now, if you get to adulthood and you haven't had any hyper secretions, but you, you finish growing, you're in height, you're not going to get any taller because you're, what are those, what are those growth plates called? What are they called? Epiphyseal plates. Epiphyseal plates are the growth plates and bones. They're closed off. You're not going to get any taller. Epiphyseal plates, closed off, growth plates. You're not going to get any taller. You're already there. But all of a sudden, there's more growth hormone than you need. And, and this is really kind of scary because people are taking growth hormone. I, I think they need to be a little cautious. But anyway, you have other bones and cartilage and tissues that will continue to grow, be remodeled throughout your life. And if it happens, you can see what happens. So like the jawline, the brow, the, the bones of the hands, um, these can all become affected with this. This is called acromegaly. So acromegaly is a hypersecretion of growth hormone in adulthood. Um, Y'all remember Andre the Giant? Do you remember him? Um, I could play the Princess Bride, but he did a lot of other things as well. But he obviously had a hypersecretion of growth hormone in childhood, but it continued, didn't it? Because y'all can sort of picture what he looked like. Do you remember? Um, anyway, now, um, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, hypersecretions can be dealt with uh, because it might be tumors of those glands and you can remove them. You can remove the tumors and sometimes even the glands, but what can happen is then you're gonna become what? Then you're gonna, what, well, I mean just with growth hormone. If, I mean hypersecretions of any glands, then you're going to become deficient. So then what are you going to have? Then you're going to be hyposecreting. Then you're going to have to do what? Replace it. Replace the hormone, right? So hyposecretions, you can be treated by replacing the hormone. Hypersecretions, you've got to figure out why you have the hypersecretion. Try to get rid of the hypersecretion, which is usually going to take you into a what? A hyposecretion, but then you can replace it. Does that make sense to everybody? Endocrine disorders are a little bit complex, aren't they? But this is why most people who have endocrine disorders that are any way out of the ordinary get sent to what? Specialist. Specialist, and they really should be sent to specialists. All right, so here, here were the goiters we talked about. I had told you guys that, um, oh, this is really, this is, um, again, can congenital. Congenital means what? What does congenital mean? It means at birth, doesn't it? So that some of these things can happen at birth. And this is why infants born in medical facilities in this country, in most industrialized countries, infants that are born in medical facilities, before they get, they get let go, and it's usually at 24 hours. At 24 hours, they can take blood work, and they can test for a lot of these things. And the, the thing about that is really nice, because catching them early, you can prevent a lot of permanent damage that can happen if you don't. So that's, that's the beauty of, of maybe deciding to have an infant in a medical facility or, or if you don't, you can even get blood work done in a day at 24 hours. They don't really much want to do it before then, but after the 24 hour uh, birthday, if you will, that first birthday day, they can do the blood work with some assurance that they can pick up some of these congenital disorders like PKU and hypothyroidism and some of the other disorders that can happen. This is a greater, and you would have to really wonder, like, okay, that did not happen overnight. So uh, you would wonder, like, why somebody waited that long? But all right. Um, and we talk about this. Now, parathyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, this is usually because somebody has taken out that thyroid gland or tried to destroy that thyroid gland. And if y'all remember, these four tiny little glands are on the back side of the thyroid. Do y'all remember that? These four tiny little glands. <clears throat> if they are surgically removed, which excise means removed, it, or something's happened to them, this is going to lead to fatal technique in three to four days if something's not done. Because what is going to happen is this is 
Parathyroid hormone is absolutely necessary to keep blood calcium levels raised enough in the bloodstream that you don't go into hypocalcemia. And hypocalcemia leads to tetany. And tetany unchecked leads to suffocation and, and can lead to respiratory distress, right? Hyperparathyroidism means you've got too much calcium, so you're trying to build bone. The calcium is getting concentrated in the kidneys where the blood is filtered, and now you're making kidney stones. What are kidney stones called? What is the real name for kidney stone? No, no, it's all right. Kidney stones, kidney stones are called renal. Renal means kidney. That is calcula, which are calcifications. So renal calcula are just, is, it's just the medical term for kidney stones. And so if you were hyperparathyroid, or if you've had repeated kidney stones, this, you should be checked for this. This is, this is just basic. And so hopefully if anybody, you know anybody's had repeated kidney stones, they get checked for this, all right? Um, and the real problem with this is that where this, where this calcium's coming from in response to this hormone is from the bone. So now the bone, if this goes over long periods of time, can become soft, can become fragile, can become deformed. And at the same time, you can be making kidney stones. This is like the hell in the hand basket right here. You No, whatever. But you, hopefully this all makes sense. Does it make sense that this will happen? All right. Um, again, we do want these things to make sense. I want you to know about the adrenal disorders. Adrenal disorders. So the adrenal glands, we knew epinephrine, norepinephrine, aldosterone, didn't we? We knew cortisol. All these things are really good things in the right amounts. They help protect us. They are going to help tissue repair. They're going to influence electrolyte balance. These are going to be great things. They're also going to contribute to even our sex hormones. We love our adrenal glands. We want them working like they're supposed to work. We know that the adrenal glands are affected by stress. Stress can be emotional, physical. It can be any of those things. But we also know the adrenal glands are targeted from a, a hormone from the pituitary called acetyl adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. ACTH from the pituitary targets the adrenal glands, right? If you have too much ACTH, it, it's not even your adrenal glands' fault. They're just following orders. And they are going to be hypersecreting. And because they're hypersecreting, you're going to probably have glucose problems. You're going to have hypertension because the electrolytes from aldosterone. Aldosterone's pulling sodium back in at a crazy pace, and your blood pressure is going up. So you've got hypertension. You're going to end up being weak because this is putting pressure on all the tissue cells. Edema. What does edema mean? Tissue. It means an excess of fluid. We're supposed to have fluid in our tissue spaces. But edema is an excess of fluid in our tissue spaces, right? So now these tissues can't even function the way they're supposed to function. Abnormal fat deposition, this moon face. In children, you see a moon face. But in adults, when somebody has Cushion syndrome, which is a hypersecretion in the adrenal glands, what you can, it can sometimes be caused because of a tumor of the adrenal cortex. Sometimes it's caused because you have too much ACTH from the pituitary. And so it can be caused because of that pituitary, sending too much ACTH. But whatever. Um, in women, it can come on much more slowly. And women sometimes go too, I think, too long without a good diagnosis where it could have just been diagnosed. It's called a, 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 a buffalo hump. It's a, it's a mound of fat that can happen between, kind of just superior between the shoulder blades. In some women, it can be diagnostic that they have a chronic cushion syndrome, a hypersecretion from the adrenal glands. So anyway, and y'all saw, y'all saw the little boy. Three months earlier, he would, his little school picture was unrecognizable. It's in your textbook. And then here he is three months later. So this was an acute onset of cushions wasn't it? And with, this is what's referred to as that moon face. This can kind of happen with people who are kept on prednisone for too long. And that is not healthy either to, to have that happen. All right, wait a minute, but I got to go back. Um, and then AGS, AGS, I told you, was when the little girls are being born with masculinized genitalia, newborn girls, but it can also have these effects on women when, that, when the onset occurs there.
from the adrenal glands. We like things in just the right amounts. I've already talked to you about diabetes mellitus, so you guys can see some of these definitions that I had given you. They're in your notes, aren't they? Um, I told you about the numbers of type 1 and type 2. And by the way, here's, here's something you need to know, and again, do your own research. 90% are in those ones we said maybe behavioral. But, and you can change a lot of people. How many of you know people who've been diagnosed with type two and they, they lost weight? It doesn't have to be a whole lot. It can just be some. They increased their activity and they've gone off their diabetes meds. How many know people? That is amazing and that is wonderful. And so a lot, if they can sustain that, their risk of diabetes complications obviously go way down, but they are forever more. It's not curable. Once you are diagnosed with diabetes, mellitus, type 2, you want to get to that, but you forevermore have it and have that predisposition for that. So you really try to do this. And you see some risk factors um, that are there that I have talked about. All right. So, and you see the pathogenesis that I talked about ketoacidosis, didn't I? Ketones in the urine, breaking down fats instead of uh, glucose for energy. So hopefully that made sense. Um, neuropathies I talked about, where the whole nervous system is poison to the nervous system. But this doesn't talk too much about insulin shock. And I told you all, insulin is a serious medicine, isn't it? So when it's given, are you having to monitor how those blood glucose levels are dropping or are being affected by that? Absolutely. So insulin shock. Pat yourselves on the back. <laughs> you just finished it. You finished the endocrine system. Um, hey guys, wait a minute. I have something for y'all, and I know uh, some of my people go to micro and whatever. But I want you to do this for me um, and, and actually give me the opportunity to do this. Everybody get one of these, and we'll look at it together. All right, get one of these. Pass them, pass them, pass them. Pass them. I just feel like All right. Does everybody have one? Y'all pass the ass. Everybody's got one. Everybody's got one. We've got some more extra. All right. Look. So when we look at this, when we look at this, I, I have given this as a quiz before. Okay. Look. No, I had I've given something like this as a quiz. I think I'm actually giving this one. But when you're studying these things, so you've got the hormone list, you've got their origin, where they're from, the target, and the function. So it, I've given this as a quiz where they had to fill in the blanks. So let's let's just go to the first one. The first line across so it's a blank for hormones, so we don't know what hormone we're talking about. We know it's one of the eight from the pituitary gland. Don't you know there's eight from the pituitary gland? And so still I don't have enough information. But let's go across and it says it conserves water, raises blood pressure. What is that hormone? It's ADH and what's its target? The kidneys. Do you see that? The next one, the only thing you're given is prolactin, but do you all know where it's from? Where is it from? Say it loud. Pituitary. Where does it target? I mean, where do we really think about prolactin? It targets mammary glands, and its function is to produce milk, right? Produce milk. Look at this next one. You only have one blank. Look at what its function is, to eject milk. What is that hormone? Oxytocin. So do you get what I'm saying? When you all are thinking about hormones, you need to be thinking, where are they from? If the target is specific, if it is, what is the target? What is its function? You good? So this is a study tool for you, but obviously it's just abbreviated because you all have a lot more hormones than these. Now where I would not like you to use this is that, you know, it's all kind of mixed up. When you're studying, you should study and get those pituitary hormones down first. Get those thyroid hormones, you know, get the, the pineal gland, get the, each organ, do it one at a time until you own it. And then at the end, let me tell you this, there are tons of questions on disorders. You must know the disorders. What must you know about the disorders? 
whether it's a hyper or a hypo secretion, which organ is involved, which hormone is involved, and what are some of the basic signs and symptoms? Fair? Is that fair? Anything we talked about, anything we talked about is fair on that test. And whatever might be in the deeper insight and what is in the disorder table. All right, so anything of that is fair. I have, for those of you who might want to do this, this is up to you, but those of you, since we, since we don't meet again until, until this test happens, I feel like it, I'm sweating too long. Um, but if anybody would like to get in a group, and now everything in here should be fair for you, because we talked about all the organs, we talked about the hormones from the organs, and in this and in this time you could use your notes. Before I didn't let you use your notes, and it got a little sketchy. Uh, but you can use your notes. If anybody would like to do this during this next hour or so, you may. If you don't have to, you don't have to. Does anybody want to want to play? No, no. Well, I'll leave them here. And you just do it. Thank you, Mom. Go a little bit. It's a really nice question. Any questions for me? So, what are we having at 9 o'clock on Wednesday? A test, multiple choice, and a lab. We'll do the lab first, where you're labeling 10 of the major endocrine. Uh, no. Look, look, can y'all just hear this, Taylor? Unless you want it, Taylor. You want it? Huh? Okay, yes, then. Okay. Because I always say. All right, so there will be a discussion board where you will have to put in your study guide, some study guides, okay? For the next. That's for y'all to see how you're doing, okay? I was going to do it as a lab, but I lost a little bit of time. It was morning. I don't know where it is. 